morning again. Good to see everyone out this morning. Uh, we can uh, be together and to worship the Lord. And we, those on Facebook, we're uh, glad to have you join with us. Uh, as we all know, here we we uh, come every first day of the week. We come around this table, and someone out there may not know. We come together to. Uh, Remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross on behalf of all of us and all who uh, believe in him. Uh, so we do this every first day of the week as an the, uh, as example given to us in, in the book of Acts. It talks about the early church. Uh, so they come together every first day of the week uh, to... Uh, to assemble together, to draw strength from one another, and they were, and they took uh, the communion in memory of Christ. We know also in the in the uh, second chapter of Acts, uh, where the disciples were waiting in the the upper room for the promise that Christ uh, told them to wait for the the Holy Spirit to come, and that, that was also on the first day of the week, which Peter uh, preached the first uh, gospel sermon that day. I'd like to read to you some words from a, a hymn that will says more than I can say. Christ Jesus, my Lord from heaven, came to save me from guilt, sin, and shame. His death on the cross of Calvary brought pardon and gave me liberty. His sweat drops his blood in prayer for me, heartbroken in dark, dark Gethsemane, while angels from blessed realms of light gave strength to his aching heart that night. Up Calvary's hill the cross he bore, and for me a crown of thorns he wore. They nailed him upon the tree to die, then darkness came over earth and sky. My Lord, who was slain by sinful man, a wonderful friend to me has been. He rose from the tomb with victory, and now I love him as he loves me. I love him because he first loved me, he first loved me, he first loved me. I love him because he first loved me and died on the cross of Calvary. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus in our lives and for the opportunity that we have to come together, that we can uh, freely assemble and to gather around this table of remembrance and and uh, remember Jesus and the, and the sacrifice that he made for us and all who will believe in him. Father, we ask your uh, bless these hymns. We take of them that they fitly represent his body and blood that was, that was broken and shed on the cross. And be with each of us as we partake. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we take this bread, Jesus, as he uh, was at the Last Supper, uh, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, This is my body, take in remembrance of me. And also he took the cup, gave it to them, and said, This is my blood that was shed on the cross. Do this in remembrance of me.
anniversary. Let's sing August, or let's sing uh, uh, birthday. Happy, let's sing happy birthday to the August anniversary. It's not working right up there today, guys. I have to say Happy birthday. family. 
than any other for this morning. Yes.
mercy, giving your grace so freely. Right? Giving us that opportunity for relationship with you, Father. That you would love us so much that you would send your son to the cross and die. So that we might be pure, might be holy in your eyes. Father, it's something we can't do.
good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, we are in uh, the final part of our series here of Follow Me. And just to kind of catch you up, if you missed or if you uh, uh, haven't uh, taken any notes or anything, uh, we said a few things. We said that Jesus invites everyone uh, to follow me. This is an invitation that all of us have received. And we said that following is all about relationship. It's not about rule keeping. But following Jesus is about building that relationship with your Heavenly Father and with your Savior. We also said that being a sinner is a prerequisite. And I know this morning Tim gave a good communion meditation in first service. And he talked about how uh, a lot of times we want to kind of clean up our act before we come to Jesus or before we come to church. And and before we become that follower, but that's not the case when Jesus invites you to follow him. Being a sinner is kind of a prerequisite. You know, all the disciples were sinners until they met Jesus and their sins were forgiven. We also said that having doubts is a prerequisite. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, every disciple or every person that's ever followed Jesus at some time or another in their life have had doubts. We said the goal of faith is to overwhelm fear. Whatever it is that seems all-consuming at the time, the goal is that your faith will overwhelm that fear and that you would know that God is with you and that you can trust God. And we also said that following will eventually cost you. And it depends on, on who you are and your circumstances as to what it will cost you. And it's usually not a monetary thing. It's usually a, a relational thing. Sometimes following Jesus will cost you friends. Sometimes it will cost you family. But following Jesus will cost you something. And we said that, that, that we all start following Jesus with our own agenda. It's for some of you, maybe you started following Jesus just because you wanted to have the hope of heaven. Or maybe you were afraid of going to hell. You know, but you start with that agenda. But eventually that you had to make a choice. Because eventually your agenda and Christ's agenda, they will always clash. But that's not something that we have to live in fear of either. Because in that moment of submitting to Christ... That's when we discover who we truly are following. Are we following our own intentions or are we following Christ's direction? Now today we're going to kind of close out this series by asking an important question that every single one of us probably ought to ask ourselves sooner or later. And I know you've heard me say that before. Oftentimes we'll say we're going to start with a question and, and look at that. But this is a real important question for most of us because most of us have been in a circumstance, and I don't want to get too ahead of, ahead of myself here, but most of us have been in a circumstance where at some point or another, we try to decide whether following Jesus is really going to be worth it or not. And if we're just honest to ourselves, we've all been there. So this is an, an, an important question for us. Before we make that kind of decision, whether we're going to not follow Christ or whether we're going to walk away from that, this is, this is a question we ought to ask ourselves and we ought to wrestle with. And this question actually comes... From a conversation that Jesus is having with his closest follower. Now, we, we've said this before that Jesus had his disciples, his 12 chosen, that would become the apostles, that would, would go and they, he, they would lead the gospel, they would lead the church in, into that first century. And then Jesus had a lot of people that just gathered, and they followed him wherever he went. They were just followers of his. So, this is a conversation he's having along with his disciples and his followers. And it's recorded in John chapter 6. So if you want to follow along, you can look there. Or you can follow along on the screen here. Just to kind of set the context. Jesus has just finished feeding the 5,000. Now, if you read in your Bibles about feeding the 5,000, Jesus is actually, uh, if you look at the Sea of Galilee, he's kind of over on the right-hand side of the Sea of Galilee in that Gerasene area, which just kind of as, as a side note, anybody remember the story about Jesus? going and healing the man that, that was possessed by demons that was living in the tombs. Anybody remember that story? That, that story where he tells the guy, now go and, and, and just go and be on your way. And, and you know, you always think about, about how Jesus impacts people's lives. Jesus never did any other miracle when he was there before that. Only that. He cast out the demons from the man living in the tombs. When he comes back to this area, he goes out and has a sermon and he ends up feeding 5,000 people. Now, when the Bible records this as 5,000 people, it's 5,000 men is who they, they have they recorded. So there surely could have been as many as 10,000 if they had their wives, maybe 15 if they had one child. So, I mean, there's a lot of people here. 
How in the world did that many people hear about Jesus? I would say it came from a man who had demons cast out of him in a tomb. So if you ever think, just as a side note here, if you ever think that your life is not affected by Christ, you don't know who's paying attention. Just a side note there. But Jesus, he's finished up feeding these 5,000 men with two fish, three loaves, you know, and, and this amazing miracle. And now they want to make him king. You know, they, they know, they think, okay, here's the Messiah. This is the one, this is the deliverer. Let's make him king. He has all of this power. You know, he's going to drive out the Romans. And we're going to be a great nation again. Jesus, come be our king. You know, the disciples are standing here. They're listening to this. And they're kind of thinking, this is what we've been waiting on. We have been waiting on this moment. Because if they're going to make Jesus king, where's that going to leave us? We're going to be in a place of position of, of some power, of some influence. And they're thinking, Jesus is going to be the new king. I can't wait for this moment to happen. But instead, Jesus does something completely off-key that they weren't expecting. He hops on a boat, and he goes over to the, to the west, to the other side of Galilee, to this town called Capernaum. And, and everywhere that Jesus went, we, we've said this before, crowds would just gather around him. I mean, when, when news come around that Jesus was coming to town, boy, people just flocked there. They wanted to see him. They wanted to see the miracles. And the crowds would gather around him. So he's in Capernaum, and the crowds have gathered around him. Uh, and, and guess who shows up? A bunch of the people that he had just fed on the other side of the lake. They followed him. They came over. And, and they wanted still, they wanted to make him king. They followed him. And now they're, they're kind of, they're, 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 I don't know if taunting is the, the best way to say it, but they're kind of taunting Jesus, telling him, hey, you know, that stuff you did on the other side of the lake with the, the fishes and the loaves, you know, do something like that again. Let's see another miracle. You know, give us something else, you know, here. And Jesus recognizes who some of these people are. And instead of rebuking them, he decides to take this moment and make this a teaching opportunity. So he begins to tell them, hey, just as I fed you, fed you bread that nourishes your body, God provides you with something else that will nourish your soul and influence your heart. And Jesus begins in this teaching by comparing himself to bread. So here's the conversation uh, as it was recorded by John, this is John chapter 6, verse 48, the story again. He says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. Now, we all even know what that is. They certainly knew what that was. I mean, this is a point where God had delivered the nation of Israel from the, the, the bondage of slavery in, in Egypt. And as they're in the wilderness, God, you know, they didn't have anything to eat. God provides manna, bread from heaven. This bread that they would feast on each and every day. And if you remember the story, you remember how the, the uh, book of Exodus records it. You know, they weren't to pick up any more than they would eat for one day. And God would just be there providing each and every day. Providing them with this manna to, to nourish them. Can you imagine what bread for them in those days like? Uh, I always thought I ate the food cake. Had to be like eating the food cake. But they had this bread from heaven that they got to, to eat. He said... Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. And then he, then he does something here that just, man, this caused a conflict. He says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. He says, I, I'm that living bread, you know, that comes down from heaven. And I can imagine these people are standing here and they're listening to this. They're thinking, no, you're not. We know who you are. We, your mom is right there. We know who you are. We know where you came from. You came from Nazareth. And there's a whole saying back in the first century, can anything good come from Nazareth? You know, so everyone's looks, listening to this. Everyone's hearing this. And, and they're thinking, we know where you were born. All of a sudden, there's this tension that kind of rises up as Jesus is teaching. And, and it starts out pretty odd with him saying, you know, I am the bread from heaven. But it, it gets Really strange, really quick. Verse 53, he says, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and you drink his blood, then you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise them up in the last day, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. And I can imagine people are covering their kids' ears by this time because they are appalled at this. You know, what is he talking about? Eating his flesh, drinking his blood, is this cannibalism? What's he talking about? And Jesus, he just continues this teaching, goes on and on, and it just gets stranger and stranger for them. And meanwhile,
Meanwhile, here's Jesus' hand-picked 12 apostles standing back there. And I imagine at this point they're looking at each other and they're thinking, Oh my gosh, what is he doing? He, here he goes with this eat my flesh, drink my blood stuff again. What, what in the world is he doing? These people are ready to make you king, Jesus. They're ready for you to, to cast out this Roman occupation. We're going to be rulers in this land. We're going to be a good nation, a great nation again. People are going to look up to us. What are you doing? And John, he tells us that in verse 40, or I'm sorry, in verse 60, Jesus says, I'm hearing it. Many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? I, I, I can't blame them. I think it's a hard teaching now. I can't imagine hearing this in the first century. He said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? In other words, hey, Jesus, I'm not sure I can go along with this. I'm not even sure I want people looking at me as one of your followers right now. And at this point, if I were here and I were teaching something like this, uh, with this kind of teaching going on, I imagine Jimmy and a couple of the other the deacons and elders would probably come and get me and take me outside and probably have a long conversation. Right, Jimmy? We, we'd have a long conversation that probably wouldn't be so pleasant for me. And we'd stand and just do our closing song and we'd be done with it. And I'm thinking the 12 disciples here, they're ready for that kind of moment. They're ready to have that long conversation with Jesus. They want to have an intervention about this message. Now, here, here's the thing. Jesus, we've said this before, Jesus knows the hearts of men. That's why you should never lie to your Lord, because he already knows anyway. And Jesus would do this sort of things every so often. He would answer questions before he was ever asked questions. So he knew the hearts of men. He knew what was going on in, in the disciples' minds and in their heart. And he says in verse 61, aware of this, his, his disciples were grumbling about this. Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Now, as I read this, a couple of things occurred to me. First off, grumbling and offended, that's two different things. I grumble a lot. My wife gets after me for grumbling all the time, but I want to be honest with you. you got to go pretty far to offend me. It takes a lot to offend me. And the disciples, they're here grumbling, but Jesus says, does this offend you? Does this offend you? In other words, you know, what, what, do, you, what do you think about this? Are you thinking... That, that maybe this is too tough for you? Maybe this isn't what you want to hear? You know, is this uh, tripping you up? And John tells us that this is a dividing moment, a transition for some of the followers of Jesus. He says in verse 66, he says, From this time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. We know that the twelve were still there, but many of the others that were following him around, they said, I'm done. I'm, I'm out. I'm out. I'm walking away. I'm walking away from this. Many of the people that chose to follow Jesus decided it's time to walk away. I'm no longer going to be a follower. I love the whole idea of Jesus. Love the miracles. But we've hit an impasse right here. And the 12 apostles, they're, they're looking at Jesus and they're looking back at the crowd and they're also beginning to think, man, things aren't looking so good. You know, while we was over there feeding those 5,000 people, we were like rock stars. Everybody wanted to be around us. Everybody wanted to hear from us. Everybody wanted to listen to Jesus' teaching. But now, things aren't looking so good here in Capernaum. It's looking pretty tough. Maybe we should move on. Maybe we should. Maybe you can walk away too. And Jesus, who knows the hearts of men, knew what they were really thinking. Verse 67. He says, you do not want to leave too, do you? You don't want to leave too. In other words, you're not thinking of walking away also, are you? You don't want to leave. You don't want to head out of here also, do you? You don't want to hit the unfollow button and just be done with this too, do you? And, and this is really relevant for so many of us. Because at one time or another in most of our lives, and I know you think, no, I won't, but, but chances are there's going to come a day that you're going to consider not being a follower any longer. And I can tell you when those times are in your life, if you're, if you're young, and it's especially true, it happens during a, a time of transition, usually sometime around leaving high school and transitioning into adulthood, or, you know, when you go to college, go to the military, or go to the workplace, you know, you're tempted to just kind of say, you know what, I, the whole Jesus thing, I'm going to leave that behind because 
now I'm busy in my career, I'm busy at school, or I'm busy at work. Another time is that a transition from adulthood to parenthood, you know, now I've got these kids and I just don't have time. It's not that I, I don't want to be a Jesus follower, I just don't have time for it. You know, from one big life change to another, you know, it seems like those are the things that happen. And, and, and what was once in our life where we might have been surrounded by Christian people who supported and encouraged you, maybe you find yourself in a position where, you know, your friends don't care about being a Jesus follower. In fact, it's kind of a hindrance to them because it's inconvenient. It's not that they talked you out of being a follower of Christ or, or, or anything like that. It's just that following Jesus just isn't a priority in your life anymore. You? you just don't have time to be a Christ follower. And after all, you've got this life to live. You've got kids. You've got all. You've got all these things going on. You're just so so busy. And it's during that time of transition. That oftentimes we fall away from being a follower of Christ. It's also during a relational time, a relational transition. I don't know if you've known this or not, but, but there's so many people we know that, that begin, you know, especially when you're young and you fall in love and, and you see that girl and she's just so, wow, you know, I mean, wow. I know she's not a Christian, but look at her. Wow. And the way I've got it figured out, anybody can be a Christian at some point, but not everyone can be like her. And if you're a lady, you know, maybe that guy is just so cute. But he's not a Jesus follower. Rabbit is so cute. And you just love being around him or her. And, and you just have so much fun together. But this Jesus thing is kind of getting in the way. You know, it's just real inconvenient. And then the last way is when we hit these obstacles in our life. And maybe you're going through that kind of a rough patch, you know, where things just aren't, aren't what you hoped that they would be. Kind of, you feel like, you know, maybe you weren't receiving what you maybe should be. And you pray, and you pray, and you pray, and God has just been strangely quiet through the whole thing. And you've always believed, and you've always been faithful, and you thought, you know, since I believe, and since I've been faithful, then, then God should, he should reciprocate with this. He should be faithful back to me, and now you're just frustrated. Because God has been silent. And most of us have been there. And if you haven't been there, you probably will be there at some point. And if you're frustrated with that and you're going through that, then you definitely need to be here next week because that's what our new series is going to talk about. Maybe for you, you're in that place in the life where because of some transition in your life or some relational development in your life, or maybe it's, it's just because you're facing something that's bigger than you imagine or bigger than you think you can handle, maybe you're considering, you know what, this Jesus thing, it's going to have to go to the back part. It's just not going to be first in my life. Now, for me, the first time in my life that I can remember kind of hitting the unfollowed Jesus, so to speak, you know, button there, I was somewhere around 17, which is a transition time in my life. In fact, I can remember uh, going to high school, or going to my, my my senior year in high school, and I put up hay all summer. I'd worked with the men all summer, and I thought I was an adult. And and the farm that I worked on, the guy that owned the farm, if you worked like a man, you got treated like a man. And that's kind of the way it was with most of the farmers, especially around here. You work like a man, you get treated like a man, you get paid like a man. And I can remember going back my senior year, walking into the school and thinking, man, these teachers are treating me like I'm a child. I'm a man. I'm 17. I'm a man. I wasn't, man. I had no idea. But I was in that transition time. I got my license, discovered girls, you know, gained some new friends, looking at graduating high school, looking at doing something after high school. And, and it wasn't that I talked myself out of believing in Jesus. It's just that Jesus following him, real inconvenient. It was really inconvenient for me. I was too busy living the teenage dream to be a devoted follower of Jesus. And I spent the next couple of years trying to figure out where Jesus kind of fit into my life. You know, I was in church, but I wasn't in that relationship with God and what he was calling me to be. And I can remember the second time that, that I was really tempted to just kind of walk away from my faith was when I lost my dad. And, and many of you know the story about dad. My dad was 54 when he passed away, which coincidentally I'm 54, so you know what goes on in my head right now. And, and I knew dad had some health issues. But, but losing that early, it just wasn't something I was ready for. 
It just wasn't something I was ready to accept. And i got to be honest with you. This was an unfollow moment for me. You know, I, I, I didn't expect to continue being a Jesus follower. Because I knew there was God in heaven, but I was done with him. I was mad and I was done with him. I blamed God when my dad passed away. I was just done with him. And I want to tell you, I'm so glad he wasn't done with me. I'm so glad he wasn't done with me. And maybe for you, you remember a moment, maybe you're right in the midst of that unfollowed moment. For whatever reason, you're tempted to just walk away and say, you know what, Jesus, I'm done with this. I'm done with it. It's too hard. It's too inconvenient. And maybe you just have enough. And that is why this piece of scripture should be so encouraging to you. Because the guys that were closest to Jesus, these are the guys that were hand-picked by Jesus. They walked with him. They talked with him. They lived with him. They ate with him. They knew him as much as anyone could ever have known him on this earth. And they had this moment where, you know, they just weren't sure. They just weren't sure about it. And Jesus asks, you don't want to leave too, do you? Now, can you imagine that moment, the tension in that moment? I mean, I mean, what do you say to that? Well, yeah, actually, Jesus, I think maybe I, you know, I mean, what do you say? Can you imagine how awkward that moment must have been? But somewhere in that moment, Peter, you remember Peter. Peter was the guy who couldn't get much right most of the time. Peter, he stands up and he says something that was so brilliant. And he asked this question. And it's a question that, that many of us, we need to ask ourselves when it comes to that moment where maybe we're just, you know, we have this tension in our lives and we're thinking, you know, maybe I'd be better off if I just did this. Follow Jesus. And this question, it was so good. And it is so wise. And I believe we owe it to ourselves to ask this question when you come to that moment in your life when you're tempted to no longer follow Jesus. Jesus asks, you don't want to leave too, do you? And Peter, the guy who couldn't almost get anything right, he asks this question. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? I mean, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One. Jesus says, you don't want to go too. Well, yes, Jesus, seriously, we do. But to whom shall we go? Where, where are we going to go? Who are we going to go to? And Peter, he recognizes something in this moment that most people never realize until it's too late. And that's that when you decide not to follow Jesus, that you're making a choice to follow someone or something else. If you make that choice in your life, I'm no longer going to follow Jesus, then you're going to replace it with something else. Something's going to take that spot. If you back away from Jesus, you're going to back into something else. And Peter, in this moment where Jesus is laying out all of the cards, Peter, he says, I've considered the options. And no, Jesus, this isn't comfortable. It's not convenient. I'm not even sure what you're talking about with all this. And do I want to go? Because after all, you know, yes, following you is costing me something. But the truth is, to whom shall I go? To whom shall I go? And isn't this often the issue for us as Christians? Because let's be honest about it. Following Jesus, it isn't easy. It isn't convenient. Nobody's really celebrating the fact that you chose to follow Jesus. In fact, for many of you, it, it, it's often contrary to that. It's kind of a source of tension between you and your friends, maybe you and your family. But i got to tell you, you owe it to yourself to ask the question, if not Jesus, who? If not Christianity, then what? Peter got it right. Jesus has the eternal words of life. And who else offers you that? And Jesus is the Holy One of God. He died for your sins so that you might have eternal life. And it costs you nothing. What else? Who else can do that for you? You owe it to yourself in that season of doubt to ask yourself. To whom shall we go? Where can I go? And who can I go to that can give me the kind of hope that I have in Jesus? Salvation is free. But following Jesus will cost you something. But I'm going to tell you, to make a choice not to answer Christ's call to follow me, it's going to cost you everything. It will cost you everything.
cost you everything. I've had friends of mine that have decided not to follow Jesus. And for them, I can look at their lives and I see the chaos. I see the disorder. I see the cost of not being a follower of Jesus. I see the things that have taken that spot of Jesus in their lives. And let me tell you something. I have never met anyone in my life that said, okay, I'm done with this. I'm going to just, you know, Jesus is taking the back burner. Something else is going to take this place. I'm going to choose not to follow him. I've never met anyone. I've never heard a story from anyone that said, you know, I used to follow Jesus, but now I don't. And man, my life got great. It doesn't happen. I'm going to tell you, I've heard hundreds of stories. It's always a catastrophe. It's always a disaster. And it always takes something like that to draw them back to being a Christ follower. To whom shall we go? If not Jesus, then who? I want to ask our musicians to come forward, and I would like that. Today, if you're having that season of doubt, maybe you're having those, those struggles in your life, and maybe for you, you just don't really know if following Jesus is worth it, then I'm going to pray with you today. Because I want to tell you, the options out there are pretty limited. If not Jesus, then do. Pray with me today. Father God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that we find in it. We thank you for the hope that we have in it. And Father, for those of us who are wrestling today, trying to figure out where we fit in, maybe where we're, we're going with this, this following of Jesus. Maybe we're having our season of that. Father, just give us peace and give us hope, knowing that if not Jesus, then what is going to take that spot? Who is going to take that spot? What are we going to choose to follow that's better than Christ? Because we owe it to ourselves to ask that question. Father, we just ask that you would give us comfort, that you would give us peace through your spirit. That, Father, we might know that we have the hope of heaven. We might know in our hearts that Jesus died for our sin on the cross. And then no matter how good of people we are ever going to be, we'll never get us into heaven without Christ. So Father, in this moment, just allow us to be humble. To have our hearts open and our minds open to know that you are truly God. And that Jesus has come to save us from our sin. That's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand this morning as we close with the, uh, our closing.